Descriptive epidemiology is one of the most powerful tools we have for understanding differential effects of exposures on health. Example, in my clinic in 2003, I had a guest. I had an undergraduate student who was the daughter of one of my college buddies who had said that she wanted to go into medicine. And he said, oh, you want to go into medicine? Spend a month with Dr. Gray. And when you get finished with that rotation and that time shadowing him in his clinic, come back and tell me you really want to be a doc. And if you really want to be a doc, then I'll help you. It's good to say that she is a physician now. But Jessica Zagary came up to me after she'd been to two of the toxicology clinics. They occur once a week. And she said, are you seeing a lot of fibromyalgia in the toxicology clinic? And I said, I don't know, that's an interesting question. I do dictate every progress note. And at that time, I had 25 years worth of data on one hard drive, all transcribed on Word. So I said, why don't we do a Word search? Let's see how many patients have fibromyalgia as a diagnosis in this clinic, in the total clinic. We have three populations. We have a general practice base. At that time, it was somewhat over 5,000 patients. And we have a toxicology clinic, which had about, oh, 700 patients at that time, half of which were chemically challenged and chemically injured, but not water damage exposed. And the other half of the clinic had been exposed in water damaged environments. When we looked at the Centers for Disease Control data, they say three and a half to four and a half percent of the general population suffer from fibromyalgia. In our total practice, we had 172 fibromyalgia patients over 25 years. In the general practice population, it was 3.8% was right in the middle of the range given to us by CDC and was encouraging because it suggested that I was not over diagnosing fibromyalgia, which is a clinical diagnosis. You audit 18 trigger points and if a person is exquisitely tender on 11 or more of those trigger points, but is not tender on four so-called distractor points that are not actually trigger points, then the person has fibromyalgia. Okay, 3.8% of the general population and general patient base, 10.9% among the patients who had not had water damage exposure but were chemically injured and organic chemical hyperreactors, the so-called multiple chemical sensitivity population. Well, 3.8 versus 10.9 is quite a robust difference. Then we looked at the water damage building exposed patients. And what we found was that the rate was 21%. Once we reviewed that data with a very simple descriptive epidemiologic exercise, it became clear that there is an association between exposure to low molecular weight organic toxins and fibromyalgia. We now have been able to take that information and use it therapeutically. When my patients with fibromyalgia get exposed to environmental triggers, number one, they experience a dramatic increase in much of their pain. Number two, if I give them extra doses of sequestrants, take an extra 10 capsules of charcoal, take an extra two teaspoons of Play, take an extra scoop of cholestyramine. Within 30 minutes for many of the patients, the pain goes away. There can be no question that fibromyalgia, whatever else it is, is clearly 
associated and at a level of reasonable medical and scientific certainty is causally related to exposure to an accumulation of low molecular weight organic chemical compounds and toxins.